Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to another episode in the series Dawa Ilallah and we have our studio here with us today as well. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. For all our guests at home who are tuning in from all over the world, we welcome you and we thank you for choosing to spend this half an hour or so with us as we investigate how to be more effective in calling people towards Allah. As we have said already in the series, the aim of Dawah Ilallah is to call people to the submission of Allah as a byproduct or as a result of calling them to Allah, they will want to read the Quran. And when they start to read the Quran, they'll want to know who the Prophet is, the final messenger, as along with all the other messengers that were sent, they'll want to know that. And then they will want to start to live a life that would be different. Remember the first person that you're going to do Dawah to is yourself. You've got to do dawah to yourself. And it's something that is done on a regular basis. It's not a once in a lifetime experience. It's not only during Ramadan when you suddenly realize, oh, maybe I should do some improvements in my life. It's something we have to do on a daily basis. I have a routine that I do and some people live in my home think I'm crazy. Most of my neighbors think I'm crazy and anyone who spends a weekend with me thinks I'm crazy. I get up in the morning and I'm like one of those motivational speakers, I go and I look in the mirror and I say, today you're going to be a Muslim. Today you're going to be a Muslim. Like trying to get myself sucked up for the day. Because sometimes you go, today you're going to be a Muslim. No. You've got to look and you've got to be serious. You've got to look in the mirror and look at yourself. Now, I don't literally go and do this. Everyone start looking in the mirror and they say, Arib told us to do this. But in the idea is there to analyze yourself every day and say, today am I going to live the life that would be pleasing unto Allah, inshaAllah. So we want to make sure that this dawah is done to ourselves. Now there are many aspects that we've been looking at at dawah. And what needs to change in the hearts and the minds of the people that we are going to be speaking to? We are following the framework that has been written by a brother who has entitled his work Dawah ilallah. So even though I had been doing Dawah ilallah all along, I realized that it is important to have other people's work that you refer to. And so there are many writers, many scholars that have written books on how to do Dawah effectively. I found that this book is the simplest and easiest for people to understand. When people read it, they go, I understand what it is. So this is what we are going through. We're going through this text and then we are commenting on it as a framework for us to refer to as we get deeper and deeper into this topic of comparative sciences and dawah ilallah. Because we are combining comparative studies or comparative sciences with dawah. Many people say, I don't want to be an argumentative Muslim. I don't want to debate. I don't want to, you cannot help it. Because when you are doing dawah, people are going to argue with you about your belief system. They're going to challenge you. So it's important that you do comparative sciences, not just comparative religion, but comparative sciences, which includes all the different fields. You have to, as a Dai, know a bit about mathematics. You have to know a bit about biology. You have to know about politics. You have to know the latest trends of the day. So you have to be a master of everything. So you have to learn a lot about everything so that you're able to answer. If somebody comes up to you and says, why do you do this? And you don't know what's going on in the local trends at the moment, you're going to look ignorant. So you have to understand that comparative sciences are very, very important when you are doing dawah. So they go hand in hand. You can't study dawah by itself without studying comparative science. And this is why we'll see even in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he knew about the customs and traditions of the people. He knew what they did and didn't do. When Syrians came, he knew how to deal with them compared to how the Jews came there, when the Christians came there. He knew how to speak to them when they even came into the mosque. He allowed them to do things that the Muslims were not allowed to do. 
because he understood that that was their understanding from a comparative point of view. People throwing spears in the mosque is not something that was common amongst the Muslims, and no one did that. But he allowed those who weren't Muslims to do that. So there are certain things, we know the story of the Bedouin who came there and urinated in the mosque. No one, no one else would be permitted to do that, but the man knew no different. But it was his understanding of comparative sciences that permitted him to be an effective or made him an effective da'i. Obviously Allah gave him that wisdom. He didn't have the privilege of being able to sit and learn from somebody else like we have today. We can learn from a hundred different sheikhs, from a hundred different sources. Maybe the worst source that we go to, the worst sheikh that we go to is who? Sheikh Google. Sheikh Google, you know, there's a poster that I saw. Some graffiti artist had made a mural and he put it on the wall and it said, in Google we trust. Not in God we trust, in Google we trust. Many people trust Google over what Allah has taught in His Word, the Quran. Many people will go to Google before going to a scholar. So Google does not know all the answers. He barely can figure out himself what he's supposed to be doing. He's just an entity, it's a program. He's not real. So people say, if you, there's another one that I saw, a very good one, also a graffiti artist put it up, and it said, it's got a picture of a prophet. From the picture, we gather that it must be from a Christian idea. And it says, I don't have all the answers, ask Google. And this is the idea that people have in the world. They think, well, you can't find the answers in Christianity, so ask Google. We are telling you not to go to any other source but the best source. You don't have to go to Wikipedia to figure out how to answer questions about Islam. You need to go to the Quran to find the questions and the answers. Sometimes we know the answers, we just have to find the question. So we must go back to the source. So there are many aspects that make up the form of da'wah that we need to be doing and aspects that we need to look at closely. And one of the aspects is found in the Quran on how we should purify ourselves and how people need, when we are calling them, to purify themselves when we call them to Islam. We are calling people to purify. Remember last week, we looked at purifying being what? A process. You don't just get a rock out of the ground, find a gold vein in it, and then the gold just jumps out and makes a perfect ring. There's a process that needs to take place in purifying that raw gold out of the rock from the vein that you find in the rock. And then you extract that and you separate the impurities. So it's a process. Let's read the text as found in the Quran and our brother will read it for us now in chapter 79. Yet another aspect is to call people to purify themselves and say to him, would you purify yourself and I guide you to your Lord so you should fear him. Surah 79, verse 18 and 19. So we see here that purification means that it's not only got to do with your body, with you and me, but it has to do with your soul, your spirit, and with knowledge, and with our belief systems, and with everything else, our families, everything. It's not just two-dimensional. It's many-dimensional, three-dimensional. We can touch it and turn it and see it in many different ways. So purification is not only about performing wudu, wuzu, as some say will say. It's not just about washing and those rules. It's also about how we change our attitudes, the knowledge that we gain, the spirit of Islam. And so when we purify ourselves, it's something that is a continuous process. I remember last time I came to Peace TV, they had a conference and afterwards they gave us these very expensive watches, but they were very fancy. But that watch, if you don't service it, it's going to not be worth anything. Even though it was cost so much money for them to buy it, it will be worth nothing if I don't yearly take it out and service it. I have to send it to some jeweler, spend a bit of money, like your car. Think about your vehicle, your motor vehicle, auto vehicle, and you don't service it when you're supposed to service it. Your little beeper will come up on your car and it says service. The motor vehicle says service the car now. If you don't service it, the value drops. The problem will start with the vehicle. Things will start breaking. 
parts will start falling out of the car as you're driving and it will start shaking and then your fuel consumption becomes more. Everything goes wrong if you do not service it. If you service it, خلاص, everything's sorted. You get better fuel consumption, everything works better. So when we see in this that Allah guides all of mankind and He purifies us, we need to purify ourselves when we call people to Islam. They need to purify themselves and we've got to purify ourselves. It means maintenance plan. It's a plan to look after your watch to make sure that it works properly by sending it to the jeweler or your car. But this is our spirit that we're talking about. This is our character, our knowledge. We have to look, what knowledge have I gained over the year that actually has nothing to do with Islam? There was somebody in one of the other studios with one of the other speakers who said to the speaker, money is haram because it's not silver and gold. It's not silver and gold. Only silver and gold are worth anything. Anything else is haram. Because they had taken an understanding that somebody had told them that actually is not based on a correct interpretation of that text. Like people will say, it's okay to take heroin and cocaine and all the other drugs and ecstasy and all the other drugs because there's nothing mentioning ecstasy and acid and cocaine and heroin in the Quran. Okay. It's not okay. You understand? If you want to take it from that point of view, then you can find, then you can do anything. You're not allowed to drive a car, you're not allowed to watch a television, you're not allowed to do anything that we see today. So you have to understand the text properly, not just your own interpretation. If you want to take it from that point of view, then you can find, then you can do anything. You're not allowed to drive a car, you're not allowed to watch a television, you're not allowed to do anything that we see today. So you have to understand the text properly, not just your own interpretation or somebody who is deviating in their teaching. And so this is why we have to purify our knowledge even. Maybe some of the knowledge that you receive is incorrect and you need to purify it, which means you have to set it on fire. And if it burns up and turns into ash and disappears, then it's supposed to do that. But if it stays and it comes back stronger than it was before, that's the right thing to keep. That's how they deal with gold, that's how they deal with titanium, silver. They send it through a process over and over. They make steel stronger and better the more times they put it through the heat, the more times they hammer it. Remember those old days you saw the blacksmith coming and hammering, making a sword and you put it back in the fire and then you take it out and hammer it. The more he does that, the more the fibers join together tighter and stronger and the connection is better. Less you do it, the looser the fibers are. And so when you use your sword, it just breaks the first time it gets hit. So it's harder to have quality. It's more strenuous to get quality. It's more expensive to get quality. But it's better to have quality. So this is what it's speaking about, how we need to purify ourselves. It's a process. It's not an inheritance right. It's not something that just happened, I'm a Muslim now, everything's going to, I'm just going to inherit everything from my mother and my father. It's a process you still have to go through on an individual basis. When we think of, if you're at home and, and you're wanting to do da'wah to people, you're calling them to a process. It's a stage-by-stage -stage belief system. That Islam was revealed in stages, that person who comes to Islam will go through stages. They will not be perfect when they come into Islam. They come into Islam to become perfect. And so, this idea of purification, one should understand that this purification is not just dealing with outward things. It's not just health, growing beards, performing wudu, all that. It's about the inward changes. But remember we said we're microwaving and we're browning at the same time. The woman will know what we're talking about. We're cooking from the inside out and we're cooking from the outside in. So don't just concentrate on the internals and leave the externals and say, well, the Internals are far more important, and because the externals are less important, I'm not going to concentrate on That's just a cop-out. That's an excuse that people give not to do the things that are required. Yes, you still have to do the externals, but not to the detriment of the internals, and vice versa. You can do them at the same time. Somebody once said to me, growing a beard is not as important as other things. I said, well, if you can't be trusted with the small things, how can Allah trust you with the big things? 
So prove that you can be trusted with the small thing. If it's such a small thing, then do the small thing first. You did a good job. I can trust you with the smaller things. Now I can trust you with greater things. Remember we spoke about sometimes when you call people to Islam, you don't have any success and it takes a long time before anything happens. Allah is testing to see how good a servant you will actually be. How sincere you will be. Remember you can also be sincerely off. You can be sincerely wrong. You can be sincerely on the wrong path. So just because you have sincerity, often we hear people say, oh, that brother is so sincere. That's not, that's not a sign of correctness. Sincerity is a process. You have sincerity, but what is your intention behind that sincerity? Is your intention behind that sincerity for Allah? Or is that intention behind your sincerity for yourself? Or is it to fool people? So maybe we must be careful when we use words. Just using words, sincerity. What are we actually meaning when we say that? A lot of Christians are sincere, but they're sincerely wrong. A lot of Hindus are sincere, they're sincerely wrong. Mother Teresa was sincere, but she was seriously wrong. You understand? So sincerity is never a sign of correctness. Not always. Sometimes it can be. We want rather to what is our intention is far more important. So we look at how we need to purify ourselves. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he purified the beliefs of the people regarding Allah, regarding the Creator, because they had impure beliefs. They had deviated in what they were teaching the people. And so when we speak about Allah to people, we are helping to purify their interpretations of what they see Allah to be. And it's not an easy question. And this is why you need to speak to your local sheikhs. You need to speak to scholars that are more greater knowledge than I about how to explain who Allah is in your own context, in your own community. If you're speaking to a Hindu, it's going to be different to the way I would tell you from a Christian perspective. If you're dealing with a Buddhist, it will be different. But it's important for you to understand the concepts of Tawheed. We don't have time in the series to go over that, all the issues of Tawheed in detail. So we're going to go through it from a bird's eye view. What is a bird's eye view? What does a bird see when it flies over the city? Does it see the street names? No. Does it know all the little cars that are parked down there? No. It gets an overview of what it sees. And in the same way, we are flying over and having a bird's eye view of many of the concepts that we're going to be speaking about. Uh, we're not going into huge detail. And this is why you need to tune into the other programs on Peace TV where many of the other brothers will be going into detail on some of these concepts that we are speaking, especially when it comes to Tawheed. And you need to, if you don't have a proper understanding of Tawheed, you need to really go and start reading up and studying that more. So when we see that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu were regarding who Allah was, purifying the understanding of the people at that time. That it was a universal teaching that Allah is one. All religions teach that, but it is the interpreter, the person who reads it, that has misinterpreted what is actually being said. So we need to purify our knowledge on who Allah is. We need to purify our knowledge on what the book says, what the Quran says. We need to purify our knowledge on the aspects of the day of recompense or the day of accounting or the day of judgment. And we need to purify our thoughts on what will happen on the day when each of us will breathe our last. So this is the idea when we are talking to people about Dawah is to bring that into the minds of the people that you are talking to. Remember, we want to major on the things that are most important first when you're calling people. So we don't want to talk about the day of judgment and death when they haven't even been introduced to who Allah is, when they haven't been introduced to the Prophet, when they haven't been introduced to the book. You understand? So those things, we don't want to scare people into Islam. We want people to become Muslims because it's the right thing to do. The Christian tactic, scare people into Christianity. Like we said, I have never in my life met a Christian who became a Christian out of love, only became a Christian out of fear of hell. Because that is the message that Christianity gives. Turn or burn. Turn or burn is their message. We never give that message. It's a fact. We tell people 
come to Islam because Allah is the one and only. He's a self-sustaining. The message of Tawheed, this is what we give. We give the message of hope. We don't give the message of terror, even though that exists. We're not denying that that is a, a fact. But we are saying that we don't go with that message. And this is what attracts people. Because we're not trying to scare them into Islam. We are opening the door for them to come in themselves if they choose. And it is Allah who guides whom He wills. And so I have never met a Christian. My sister is terrified of hell. That's the only reason she's a Christian. Not of the love of Jesus or whatever she professes, she's still a Christian. Not because of the love of God, it's the terror of hell that makes her a Christian. See, it's different in Islam. That is a part, but it's not the emphasis that we are giving to people when we are calling them to Islam. Remember, the order is to call to Tawheed, then to the Quran, then to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that there will be a day of reckoning. And then, as a final part, we talk about the day of what will happen to those who choose not to follow and those who choose to reject with knowledge. So when we look at this text that we saw, one little small verse, one small ayah of the Quran, we see so much in it. And it says, would you purify yourselves and I guide you to your Lord so you should fear him. So he wants you to have a righteous fear of God. Righteous fear, balance and fear. Do you love your fathers? Do you love your mothers? At home, do you love your father? Do you love your mother? Yes, you do. But you also fear them as youngsters. Maybe even as older people, we still fear our parents. But it's not fear that we are unable to speak to them. It's not fear that we are unable to ask them for anything. It's a fear within balance. Some people don't understand this word fear. They get very confused, especially the Christians. They go, but you live in terror and fear. That's not what it says. It's the fear of knowing that there is that respect that still needs to be there. There is a cult of informality that has entered into many religions in the world. The cult of informality. They become informal with God. They say, hey, God, give me a car. Not ask him, give me. How dare you say to Allah what he must do? And this is what happened. Many of these prosperity churches, we call them the name it, claim it, and fame it. I name it in the name of Jesus and I want my car and I'm guaranteed to get it because I demand it. It's my birthright. That's what they're doing. These Pentecostal churches, you'll see them on television, the ones with their spray painted blue hair. You see these old ladies with their blue hair. They tell everyone, phone now and if you give $500, God will multiply it for you. It's all just about money. It's not about honesty and truth. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program. Time has gone so fast. Make sure you're at home. If you want to know what's going to happen next and how to be more effective, join us again next week. Same place, same time. So from us in the studio, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.